Hi, IB Biology students. This is Ms. Sheely with your next installment of Video Lecture Notes. Today's um, lecture is on 6.4, which is gas exchange. This presentation is adapted from Stephen Taylor's um, presentation from iBiology.net. Um, Mr. Taylor does not, no longer keeps the um, iBiology.net updated for the 2016 curriculum. Remember, while you're taking notes, to jot down not just your notes, but any questions you have and bring those to class so that we can discuss. Thanks. All right, the first thing that we need to know is that breathing is not the same as respiration. When we're talking about respiration, we're talking about cellular respiration and the production of ATP at the cellular level within the mitochondria. And we are talking about aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration. Um, using oxygen or not using oxygen. Breathing is ventilation and gas exchange. So the definition of ventilation is the movement of air in and out of the lungs in two stages, both inspiration and expiration. And it's controlled by the movement of both the diaphragm and the rib cage together. The gas exchange is a result of that ventilation. It's the exchange or diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from the blood through the alveoli and the respiring tissues. So both are going from concentrations of high concentrations to low, and they're moving um, in opposite directions because of that concentration gradient. All right, so the ventilation system, small organisms such as flatworms, protists, and bacteria actually exchange their gases directly through their surroundings, through um, their bodies, through diffusion. Larger, larger organisms have adaptations that reflect their environments, um, such as gills to extract the, car the oxygen um, and remove carbon dioxide um, to the water. Insects use trachea tubes from the exoskeleton for gas exchange because they have a very small size and a very short diffusion um, path. But land-based mammals and some waterborne mammals, um, including humans, have evolved to have an internal ventilation system which allows for that gas exchange. So as we talk about anything, you want to think about how the structure, the function, and the evolution are demonstrated by this topic. Remember, structure and function go hand in hand. All right, so the ventilation system. For gas exchange to be efficient, we actually need high concentration uh, gradients, and those are maintained within the alveoli. Breathing in will increase the concentration gradient of oxygen between the alveoli and the blood because we're taking that oxygen from our surrounding environments, um, and therefore that oxygen will diffuse into the blood cells. But breathing out will remove carbon dioxide and any unused oxygen, and um, that will increase the gradient of carbon dioxide between the blood and the alveoli. So the carbon dioxide will diffuse out. And here's a great um, picture of what's going on. This would be a, a simple three-lobed alveoli. Um, and then our carbon dioxide here in red. And then our oxygen mo molecules as the double blue. So the oxygen going into the blood cells and the carbon dioxide going out. If the alveoli were not ventilated, equilibrium would be reached and that gas exchange could not, that those gases could not be exchanged. So we're going to watch a little um, animation, see what. All right, so we're going to watch this animation of gas exchange from the McGraw-Hill Publishers. Respiration serves as a means for the body to exchange gases with the atmosphere via the blood. The Respiration serves as a means for the body to exchange gases with the atmosphere via the blood. The partial pressure of oxygen, PO2, in the air in the alveolar spaces in the lungs is greater than the PO2 in the blood, so oxygen diffuses into red blood cells from air in the lungs. Also, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, PCO2, in the air in the lungs is less than the PCO2 in the blood. So carbon dioxide diffuses out from red blood cells and into the air in the lungs. 
Oxygen-rich blood is carried through pulmonary veins to the heart and then pumped through systemic arteries to the body. The PO2 in the blood is higher than the PO2 in the body tissues, so oxygen diffuses out from red blood cells at the body tissues. Also, the PCO2 in the blood is lower than the PCO2 in the body tissues, so carbon dioxide diffuses into red blood cells there. Oxygen-poor blood is carried through systemic veins back to the heart and is pumped through pulmonary arteries to the lungs, where gas exchange again replenishes the blood with oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. All right, so that um, animation was just, again, going through the gas exchange during respiration or ventilation. Um, so you want to make sure that you keep those straight between respiration and ventilation. A lot of textbooks um, do kind of switch back and forth between those. But in our class, we're going to talk about ventilation um, as being breathing and respiration, more at cellular respiration level. All right, so now I want to take you through a respiratory basics. Um, this is another good site to look at um, as you review as well. All right, so here we're going to look at respiration basics. So you can see just the air coming in and then the air coming out. So when you breathe, what happens to the air that goes in before it comes back out again? We've kind of talked a little bit about that, but this is going to present it in another way. This process is called respiration. The first step is ventilation, the air in and the air out. Here we're going to zoom in, and you can see the alveolus. So it goes into the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, through the bronchi and into the individual lungs, and then we zoom in to the alveolus or alveolus. External respiration is the process of that gas exchange between the alveoli, or specifically the lung, or the lungs, specifically the alveoli, and the blood. Some of the air that you just inhaled from the atmosphere, which is in your alveoli, will now enter your bloodstream. You can see here the interconnection between the heart and the lung system. So we've talked about the heart before. Here is your right atria, your right um, ventricle going into your pulmonary artery, circulating through the lungs. That's where that gas exchange will happen. Coming back in through the pulmonary vein into the left atria, then the left ventricle, and then going to the body through the aorta. Um, when it's leaving both of those areas, it's not just going to the left lung, it is going to both the left and the right lung at the same time. So the oxygen in the air that you inhaled is more concentrated in your alveoli than it is in the blood vessels that come into the lungs. So because of this, the oxygen leaves your alveoli and enters that bloodstream. So that's that high um, concentration gradient of the oxygen in the alveoles and the low concentration gradient in the capillary. So that exchange can happen in the reverse for the carbon dioxide. There's a high level of carbon dioxide in your blood when the vessels enter the lungs, so that carbon dioxide leaves the vessels and enter the alveoli. So we're going from a high concentration in the bloodstream to a low concentration in the alveoli. And this is going to allow the carbon dioxide to leave your body as you exhale. The oxygen travels in your blood back to your heart where it's then pumped out to cells in the rest of your body. The oxygen is transported by hemoglobin in your red blood cells so that the, um, your oxygen binds to the hemoglobin where the carbon dioxide is primarily transported as a bicarbonate ion. And that process is known as gas transport. It brings the oxygen from your lungs to the cells and takes the carbon dioxide from your cells um, throughout your body and returns it to the lungs to be exhaled. So here's a nice little animation of the blood cells um, exchanging those molecules. So after leaving your lungs, the oxygen diffuses from the hemoglobin in the red blood cells to the systemic tissues and the carbon dioxide is generated by the cells diffuses into the bloodstream so we're working in a reverse still working with in a diffusion but in a reverse concentration gradient so now we have a high concentration of oxygen in the law in the bloodstream 
low concentration in the tissues of oxygen, so it's able to diffuse out of the bloodstream and into the tissues. And the carbon dioxide has a high concentration of the tissues and a low concentration in the bloodstream, so it's able to diffuse out of the tissues and into the bloodstream. This gas exchange occurring between the blood and the systemic tissue cells is known as internal respiration, ventilation. All right, so respiration involves four steps. First, ventilation. Then external respiration. Transport. And internal respiration. So again, that's a really nice little website that can take you through it um, kind of step by step looking at the entire process. So that's a pretty nice little site. All right, so um, as we just saw in that last animation, uh, we looked at the alveoles and that exchange of the gases. But I want to look at this more particular in terms of their structure. They're actually very well adapted to gas exchange and their structure has to do with their function. Um, so here again we have a structure function relationship. So alveoli increase the surface area for gas exchange. There are millions of alveoli in your lungs. Each alveoli has their own network of capillaries both um, uh, excuse me have their own network of capillaries um, and capillaries um, are not uh, blood uh, going to or from they're they're the ones that are connecting the blood system to the tissue themselves so a rich blood supply maintains that high concentration gradient of oxygen and carbon dioxide the membranes are very thin for the alveoli, so um, and that's actually of both the alveoli and the capillaries. And this uh, is really important because it allows the diffusion path to be very short. If you look at um, this picture here, we have um, just the one thin member membrane on the alveoli and the thin membrane on the capillary. So if you count the membrane on the red blood cell, that's just three membranes that the molecules need to transfer through or move through, diffuse through in order to uh, go down that concentration gradient. The surfaces of the alveoles are wet. Um, this allows the gases to be dissolved, so that's going to make the diffusion process easier as well. So increasing surface area with a network of capillaries, the membranes being thin and the surfaces being wet, all of those structures relate to or um, help the function of gas exchange. So just like I just spoke about um, how many membranes must an oxygen molecule pass through in order to enter the erythrocytes or the blood cells, and it's going to be three. The alveoli and the capillaries are each one cell thick, so that is one, two cells, and then there's also a membrane to pass through in the red blood cells, so that's three membranes total. All right, the ventilation system, let's talk about the um, uh, parts, the tissues, the organs that make up this system. So you have your trachea, which is the first main tube um, coming down from the mouth. That inserts into, breaks off into two branches called bronchi, and then each bronchi have many branches that are called bronchioles. Each bronchioli ends in an alveoli cluster and those make up the lungs. So the alveoles, the bronchioles, and then the bronchi make up the lungs. The diaphragm is just below the lungs and is also part of the ventilation system. You also have intercostal muscles, and those are muscles that are in between your, rig your ribs, and they control the movement of the rib cage. And remember, it's the movement of the rib cage and the diaphragm together that help our lungs um, to take in that oxygen and release that carbon dioxide. So you have um, intercostal muscles, you have external intercostal muscles, internal intercostal muscles, and innermost intercostal muscles. You have three sets of intercostal muscles, but they're all between your ribs here. All right, so how does ventilation actually work? So remember that ventilation is two parts. It's inspiration and expiration. 
and you do need to know the steps of how each of these happens. Think about it as you're going through this and kind of slowly take deep breaths in and out and, and, and try and feel what's happening inside of your own bo uh, body. So an inspiration, your external intercostal muscles contract. So these are the ones um, on the outer part of your rib cage. This is also going to cause your diaphragm to contract. And remember, when your diaphragm contracts, it actually drops. Um, when your diaphragm contracts, it contracts down towards your abdominal cavity. And then your abdominal muscles will relax as your diaphragm contracts. This is going to increase the volume in your chest. By your diaphragm dropping, it's increasing the amount of space um, that your chest holds, the volume. And so the pressure in your lungs decreases and air can enter. And then the reverse will happen in inspiration. Your internal intercostal muscles okay, contract. So in inspiration, your external intercostal muscles contract. Now for expiration, your internal intercostal muscles contract. Your diaphragm relaxes, which means it rises back up. So it's going to start to push on your lungs and your abdominal muscles will contract. This is going to decrease the volume in your chest and the pressure in your lungs will increase so the air is pushed out of your body. So definitely, besides just writing this down, really go through it step by step. Make sure that you're thinking of what's happening. It is kind of the opposite of one is happening in the other. Um, but do uh, the students have pre in previous years gotten the movement of the diaphragm is really the most confusing because when it does contract, it moves towards the abdominal cavity, which is a little backwards from what um, some students think. Asthma, um, in case you're interested, but Ivy would like you to be interested and aware, um, asthma can be caused by both environmental and genetic factors, and asthma attacks can be triggered by many factors and must be treated quickly and safely for the um, person having the attack to be able to survive. Inhalers actually contain hormones which cause the bronchi um, to work. Okay, so they're going to relax and allow air in. So when an asthma attack occurs, the hormones relax the muscles of the bronchi, and that's going to allow them to open up and the air to flow much more normally. So asthma sufferers must be aware of their particular triggers, because it's not the same for everyone, and take steps to avoid them or to decrease them as much as possible. So I do have a quick little um, video clip Asthma is a chronic long-term condition that can be managed but not cured. Asthma affects the airways of your lungs. It causes the airways to narrow and swell, resulting in wheezing and difficulty breathing. During breathing or respiration, air goes in through our nose or mouth to the upper airways, at which point it reaches the windpipe, which branches into two large bronchi to reach the lungs. The lungs are protected by the rib cage, which also contains the muscles that control your breathing. In asthma, the airways are oversensitive and easily irritated by certain triggers, called asthmatic triggers. Most people with asthma are described as atopic, meaning they have an allergic type reaction to external triggers, such as house dust mites, pollen, cigarette smoke, animal fur, and chest infections. However, for some people, the onset of asthma is unpredictable and may be caused by anxiety, stress, or even laughter. An asthmatic trigger causes the airway walls to swell and the muscles around the airways to contract. The airways narrow and breathing through them produces a whistling sound called wheezing. Mucus is produced from the lining of the airways 
which clogs up the narrowed airways further and causes coughing. This makes normal breathing more difficult, producing symptoms of asthma that can be mild, moderate, or severe and life-threatening where hospital treatment is needed. The narrowing of the airways is reversible if the trigger is removed or if the inflammation is treated medically. Therefore, preventative treatment is used and can be managed by the patient themselves. An acute asthma attack requires medical intervention, but the type of intervention depends on the severity of the attack. All right, that's it for today's notes. Um, please remember to bring your notes to class and also any questions that you may have. Have a great evening.